Hello, Latinx and animation and La Leaf audience, uh, planners, members, participants. So excited to be here. My name is, and I'm going to introduce myself in Spanish, uh, Sulema Uriarte. My pronouns are she, her, her, and ella. Uh, I am currently wearing my hair in a ponytail with big gold hoops, which I love. Um, they make me feel really great. Uh, black framed glasses and a floral type bomber jacket. Um, I work at Netflix. I support the animation business as director of inclusion. And in addition to that, I am so proud and honored to be on the board of Lanex in animation, which I have been proud to see grow over the years and creating amazing impact in our industry. I would love to introduce or ask uh, my friend Tito to introduce himself. Thank you, Zulema. Uh, my name is Tito Ortiz. My pronouns are he and him. Uh, as far as what I look like, I'm wearing a gray sweater with a white polo. Uh, I am a creative executive and producer with Netflix feature animation. I am so excited to learn about your journey. Tito, I've had the pleasure of getting to know you uh, the last couple of years, but I'm going to get to learn more about you today. So could you walk us through how did you get into the animation industry? Where did you start out? Um, how did you get to where you are today? Many of our members of Latinx Animation and La Leaf are trying to find their way through the industry, navigate, figure out what works best for them. They could be early career, they could be mid-career, um, they could be uh, much more uh, later stage in their career. So just walk us a little bit through that. Absolutely. This story, I will say, I will try to make it uh, brief and succinct, but it has a lot of twists. And I think there could be value in sharing some of those twists because I've been told that my story is a bit unconventional. So with that disclaimer, I will say that in the late 90s, I was an actor and a musician living in New York City. I was the lead singer of a Latin rock band that had a brief stint with Electra Records before I moved to Los Angeles in 2003 to shoot a pilot for ABC. Now, the pilot wasn't picked up, and at the time, I decided that I wasn't going to continue auditioning. I had worked at a law firm in New York, as well as a medical communications company, and the thought of not having a, quote, steady job was becoming less and less attractive. So I sat down with a friend of mine who had been living in Los Angeles for a number of years to ask for some advice. It so happens he worked for Mark Gordon, the producer behind films like The Day After Tomorrow, Saving Private Ryan, TV's Grey's Anatomy, Criminal Minds. And what started as a casual catch up turned into a development conversation about a movie that he was working out uh, and trying to crack his third act. I found through that discussion, I was fascinated by what he was doing, by what he was talking about. And I think I didn't put a whole lot of thought into it, but I asked him how I could potentially work in development. And his first reaction was, you don't want to do this. <laughs> he said, this is the last thing you want to do. But I kept, I kept nudging. So he said to me that if you think you can do it, you have to start at the bottom. Now, at the time, I just turned 30, and I felt in myself, and after speaking with my family, that I had another turn in me when it came to life. I had the wherewithal to make another change and start again. So with that, I began as an intern at Mark Gordon, getting coffee, you know, making copies. That lasted for two weeks. 
Then I got onto a desk as a temp for six weeks. And then eventually I made it onto one of our vice president's desk as a creative assistant. So that stint in live action for me lasted about two years. And it was a great, great time. I learned a ton. I was on set with certain films, read a lot of scripts. And after two years, there wasn't necessarily a place to be promoted uh, up. There was nowhere to go. But Mark, uh, being a wonderful boss and mentor, then introduced me to Chris Melodandre. Now, Chris at the time was leaving Fox Animation where he was finishing Horton Here's a Who with Jim Carrey and starting his own company. Now, at the time, the last thing I thought was that animation was something that I'd want to do. I thought I was a live action guy. But talking with Chris about the medium, about how animation was able to tell stories in ways that were so visually compelling and that had scale and that had nuance and that a medium that was able to take characters and really, really cut to the heart of the complexity of these characters felt so inspiring that I decided to make the move from live action to animation. So with Chris and three other executives, five of us, we rented space on the west side in Santa Monica and thus began Illumination Entertainment. Our first movie was Despicable Me. And all together, I was with that company for seven years through Despicable Me, The Minions, Secret Life of Pets, Sing, finally The Grinch. So uh, after IE, I then spent three years in Montreal producing an independent animated feature, Playmobil, the movie. Right around then, I came back with my wife, who also works in the industry, and we moved back into Los Angeles just before the pandemic hit. So during the pandemic, I spent time writing a TV pilot, treatments for animation, and that is when uh, Netflix uh, came calling. And that brought me to this moment. Wow, that is uh, that is so wonderful. I think more often than not, we're seeing that our journeys are not linear. It's got ups and downs and twists and turns and reroutes. Um, and it's just great to remind ourselves that it may not be how we envision it, right? How the journey is I idealized in our minds or how folks tell us it should be um or even how our parents want it to be for us right it's very um, true yeah how do you how do you this is a question I always love how do you explain to your family what you do like what is the job of a creative executive in animation I think Depending who you ask, it could be different things. And, and that answer, I know to some might seem insane because we do work in an industry and in businesses that are very defined. Mm -hmm. But I think that as a creative executive, there are parts of it that are business focused and there are parts of it that are more about instinct, passion, and creativity. So I would say from my experience, a CE's function is to identify talent, IP and original ideas that can lead to compelling stories and to manage the development process through production to deliver a successful film. Now, that can sound like an oversimplification. It is because there are many stops along the way. But in order to find great talent or ideas in a practical way, a CE has to be constantly reading scripts books, writing notes, networking with agencies, other studios or production companies. You essentially have to become a student of this industry and gather as much knowledge as possible regarding you know, your corner of the business. The other thing that goes with that is I think it's very important for an executive to line up their creative taste with the creative mandate of the company that they're working with. And what I mean by that is we all have our own personal taste and obviously creative is subjective. 
one could look at one movie or another and say, I think that's great. I think that's great acting. Someone else can say, I, I disagree. But when it comes to our business, I think there is a lot of responsibility having to be placed on an executive when they go out looking for material. That material, uh, let's put it this way. If I work for a children's company that specializes in preschool entertainment, I'm not going to source a horror movie. <laughs> so when you get to a studio level, some studios, you have the luxury of you know, developing many different kinds of genres. But I think more and more in today's industry that has become so competitive and so noisy, when you're looking to rise above the clutter, you really have to have a targeted view of what you're going for, a North Star. So in a company like Illumination Entertainment, that North Star, one could argue, was defined by creating the most broadly appealing universal stories for the family audience. We're talking about appeal through design of character, design of environment, songs, terrain of story. And those kinds of films are the bread and butter of a company like that. So as a creative executive, you would go out and find more of that. Of course, there are always going to be exceptions, but I think to have a smooth running of a department, everyone needs to be on the same page in terms of what are the greater needs of the company from a creative standpoint. Yeah, super fair. Um, you had some time in live action and then you made a transition that has seemed to stick in animation. What keeps you in animation, right? It takes so much longer to produce anything in animation. Um, live action, you can be churning projects every, you know, two quarters. Why do you stay in animation? It's a very good question. And it's one that at times I've asked myself <laughs> because live action does move faster. I think with animation, when I look at the process, unlike live action, because of the fact it takes so long, you have an opportunity to look at stories from dozens of angles. You have the opportunity to grow characters over a number of years. And you too can grow with these characters as you're making choices and looking for different ways of how they express themselves. Along that journey, you are guided, I think, by the thematic underpinnings of that story. The meaning of the story is what guides you. But you have that time with your director, with your writer, with your team, with your producers, to really be thoughtful about the kind of character and story you're putting out into the world. And to me, that is a very compelling and exciting aspect of animation because it allows you to really keep an eye on what is happening around you and look for the most relevant and universal expression of the film that you're working on. Sometimes in live action, not always, because there is a shorter period of time, you can decide on something, agree on it, commit and put it out. And that's great. And many have had tremendous success with that. I just think with animation from my personal point of view, I enjoy the marathon as opposed to the sprint. I enjoy every moment of discovery. And in a very simple way, uh, I enjoy the people because I feel in animation, as you know, Zulema, it, you become part of this family, this fraternity of, of creators. And it's a community that is very small, mm -hmm. but very mighty. Yeah, I love that. What is something that you wish you would have known sooner? I think in hindsight, uh, I wish I would have known sooner that there is no crystal ball in Hollywood, that no one knows anything. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that everyone's looking for the same thing, a great idea for a movie or a show. And early on in, in my career, I put a lot of stock in ideas or opinions that came from other individuals 
or companies because they were perceivably successful, sometimes practically successful, but perceivably there was a standard. But over the years, I've seen those, some of those very people and companies make their mistakes. I've been part of those mistakes. I've had to learn from those mistakes. And in the past, I used to create a standard based on what was happening around me rather than defining a standard based on my own creativity, my own integrity, and my own definition of what a great executive should be. And once I did that, I became a lot happier and my job became a lot more gratifying. Yeah, I can see that. So I want to learn more about your, a little bit more about your music career. Um, you were also an accomplished musician, composer, which I'm sure you've brought into your world, your roles in animation. Um, how did you make that transition or still do both? Uh, especially with an established career as a producer, an executive. Um, and I'm sure that you like to do other things outside of working in your life. <laughs> so how do you, how did you do that transition? How do you balance it? It's uh, it's an interesting balance and it's gotten easier. I've been playing music and singing since I was a teenager and it's something that is part of my heart. I think it's something that uh, I'll be doing well into my later years. As far as how it connects to this industry, I think a few years ago, uh, I made the decision to stop fighting, uh, connecting the, the two areas of my life, music and producing film. There, uh, For many, many years, I labored over this sense of or this question of which is it gonna be? Do I pursue music? Do I pursue film? And I was racking my brain just trying to, you know, reconcile what that meant. And the moment that I stopped doing that and realized that both feed one another, my life became much easier when it came to balancing the two. As far as that journey professionally, the way that happened was after I came to LA in 2003, music took a bit of a, a back seat. I developed a vascular ulcer on my vocal cords and had to have surgery uh, in order to get my voice back. So I went through about nine months of vocal rehab to be able to talk naturally. And singing at the time was something that was kind of iffy. And I remember the moment that I sat down at my desk after nine months, picked up my guitar and I sang a song. And I'll never forget when I was able to hit those notes again, I called my mom and I put her on speaker and I said, I said, mommy, listen, and I sang to her. And what that did for me, it felt like a second chance. So while I was working for Mark Gordon and then well into my years with Illumination, I began volunteering uh, uh, through an organization called the Art of Elysium, uh, going to children's hospitals and going room to room to sing for kids. And that became very fulfilling to me. I started to record again. And as luck would have it, a friend of mine who I've known since I was in first grade introduced me to his cousin, who was a producer in Nashville, Tennessee, who also toured with and tours with uh, country artist Emmy Lou Harris. He heard some of my music and decided to have me out to Nashville, where I recorded a record. And it's that record that then found its way to a composer producer here in Los Angeles. Uh, and that relationship started, I would say, 10 or 12 years ago, and we still have it today. And what we do is he and I have found a method of working together where we swap ideas musically over email, lyrics, we'll put together songs over a few weeks, over a couple of months, then get into his, his studio and record. 
And the main objective now is pitching those songs for filming TV. So we have had songs on, you know, Lucifer, on Fox, on Shameless for Showtime, you know, on Fox Sports for FIFA, you know, the World Cup in 2022. And that business part of the music for me has really been fulfilling because it allows me to continue singing, to continue playing, but it also allows me to develop and have developed a way of communicating in film with my composers on a film, with my directors when it comes to their vision uh, for the music of a film. And those two worlds have now just splashed and crashed into each other and have become additive. So the balance is a very organic one. And as far as in a practical sense, I really believe that the things that matter in your life, you make time for. So I'm not even aware of the time that's put in as much as I'm aware of the results that are coming out of it, both in film and in music. That was a very long-winded way to answer that oh, question. I love that. <laughs> I have a follow, I have two follow-up questions. What song did you sing to your mommy when you called her? And what is your favorite song to sing? Ooh, that's a good one. The song I sang to my mom was an original song uh, that was on the album that I recorded in Nashville. And the song is called Play Your Guitar For Me. And my favorite song to sing, there are a lot of them. <laughs> so I will actually tell you one of the first songs that I fell in love singing with singing was a country song by Colin Ray. And the song is called Love Me. Old country song. I learned it by watching an artist when I was in Cape Cod uh, at this barn concert. <laughs> and I saw another acoustic artist sing this song. And I was so taken by it that my uh, partner and I at the time who I was playing uh, music with we, were, we took him to the side of the barn outside and sat there with our guitars, learning the chords to this song so that we could sing it. And after that, I, I sang it every chance I could. How awesome is that? Um, I'm gonna pull on I'm gonna pull on one of the strings <laughs> from what you said earlier, which is the the journey of getting your voice. And I'm gonna translate that to um the voice that we feel empowered not only physically to have but also um I think emotionally right I think often folks struggle to feel like their voice matters or how to use their voice to advocate for themselves um, and I would even say depending on where you are in your career advocating for others as well um, as you've grown, how have you advocated, one, for your own advancement, for the advancement of folks um, that you see potential in? And then I'm going to just further, is like, how are you thinking about the advancement of, of representation uh, within animation of the Latinx community or Latinx community? Mm -hmm. A lot of questions there. <laughs> no, it's great. And they're important questions. I think as I've grown professionally, one of the great things about experience and working with companies like Illumination and companies like Netflix is that it does give you a platform. It gives you access. And one of the ways that I've supported growth around me from people who, professionals who are, as you said, maybe starting out or even switching careers, is by really sharing the breadth of my experience in ways that I, I find could be additive to someone else's experience. And what, I'm, what I mean by that is um, even recently, I had uh, a member of my team come to me for advice and to talk about you know, part of their career and, and what they were doing. And I, I think, a lot of it has to do with giving your time freely and willingly and consciously. It's it's a matter of, you know, for myself, I make it a point to carve out that time to have a meaningful conversation and exchange with someone and to so to allow me to be present in that moment. And 
the experience that I've had, I will share in the hopes that it can give young people or people, again, who are, are, are growing in, in, in their jobs, more information that I didn't have. And I feel that part of it too, there's a lesson in vulnerability in there because there could be a tendency when you have that platform and you, at, and you are at a senior position to be the boss and to create you know, walls between you and other people in your company. Now, I understand obviously there needs, there needs to be a healthy balance between being professional and being a friend, of course. This is a business. But I do think there is not enough vulnerability shown when it comes to senior leadership opening, this, opening themselves up to questions, to be questioned uh, when it comes to their team. So through that, I find that team members and people can become more comfortable. They become more vocal. Uh, I encourage them to share their ideas and their opinions by creating a safe space for that to occur, I find that I can see, I can feel the growth because a lot of what I, what I will tell people is that there's that part of the job that is the administrative part when you're coming up in any type of job, the paper part, the charts, the, you know, the calls to return. But once that's all out of the way, what's left is the interpersonal and the creative. Those are skills that I think you acquire through experience, but to accelerate that growth, I think people in positions of, of leadership or in positions of, uh, uh, again, having those platforms, the more they open themselves up, the more they lean into the vulnerability of themselves and what they've gone through and share that with other people, that is a way that you can accelerate that growth. As far as advocating, and supporting through Latinx? It's a great question. It's a great question. Because I find that the material that is generated in mainstream Hollywood, we've made a lot of strides. And we certainly have many advocates and many strong voices leading the charge in getting Latinx content into the mainstream. But as we know, it's not enough. It's not happening as much as it should, and it's not as frequent as it should be. For my part, I think that looking through the lens of myself being Equatoriano, being a first-generation American, there is a desire to not only look for stories that are culturally diverse, inclusive, when it comes to my own cultural background, but also to have a consistency in the awareness of voices that are underserved. So through the lens of being Latino, I'm looking at all cultures in terms of how we can bring those voices forward. It's a challenge because one thing you hear in mainstream Hollywood is that there are certain types of movies that are successful and certain types of movies that are not. They fall into categories of big blockbusters. They fall into categories of, of indie. And I had a conversation recently with a uh, director, a wonderful, wonderful director, Jorge Gutierrez, Book of Life, Maya and the Three, who is part of the Netflix community. And we were talking about a film that uh, he is directing called I Chihuahua. That film is the story of an underdog, quite literally. It's a Chihuahua who competes in, in, in Lucha Libre. And the conversation that Jorge and I had was discussing how this film has the potential to transcend being just a, what others perceive as a Latin film or a film from a Mexican director and being something that can be embraced by the entire world. It's hard, but when I look at those opportunities, I'll take this film as an example. Uh, Chihuahua. There are universal elements in this film from a character standpoint, from a story standpoint. It's about family. It's about finding the strength within yourself. Thematically, there is a resonance in this film that should not 
depend on whether people embrace it as a Latinx film or embrace it as a mainstream film. It should simply exist on its own because it is a film about fulfilling a dream. So I think for myself as an executive, as a producer, when I'm looking at films that have a cultural backbone to them, especially uh, in the Latin culture, I'm looking for expressions that can not only serve my community and maintain the integrity of those cultural, the cultural DNA of those stories, but also deliver them in a way that feels relatable, that feels universal, because ultimately those are the films that are going to help our community travel and break borders and travel internationally. Um, it's work that has to continue. It's work that at times can feel elusive when you look at the kinds of product that we're putting out in the world, but it is absolutely necessary. It is absolutely vital. Yeah, yeah. How about when you advocate for yourself? I don't know if like me, I have a really hard time doing it. It takes a lot for me to do it. So I'd personally love to hear how, what that experience is like for you. I agree with you. It's hard. And it can be hard. At times, it can be, be one of the most difficult things you can do. And I think for myself, looking back on how, how I was brought up, I'm the youngest of four. I have two older brothers and an older sister. My mother and father came to the United States for the American dream, to build a better life for us. And they instilled in me a set of core values that I cannot escape. <laughs> and I don't want to escape. They are values that have helped me advance in my career. They, they helped me create lasting relationships with friends. They helped me uh, build a beautiful marriage with my wife. And the reason that I bring all that up is because early on in my career, when it came to advocating for myself, one of the things I touched on earlier was creating standards as defined by others. I think as human beings, we all experience insecurity at different times in our lives. Everyone has it. It doesn't matter who you are, what level you're at. Everyone has fear at different times. For myself, I have gone and probably will go through again, those moments of feeling less than, of feeling afraid. But I find, especially in the last 10 years or so, I have leaned into my values. I've leaned into lessons learned through my family, through my friends, with my wife, that serve almost as a mirror to show me the best qualities of myself. And when I access the best parts of myself, I find I am able to speak up. I am able to communicate uh, effectively. And even if sometimes that messaging can get a little murky as it's going from me to <laughs> uh, for another professional, it's okay because I believe that, you know, we are all works in progress as the saying goes, but we need to keep trying. And there's a wonderful Ted talk from Brene Brown that talks about the power of vulnerability. And by leaning into vulnerability, I have become a greater advocate for myself because it has taken the pressure off of me to have to impress others. And rather, it has instilled in me an excitement to celebrate those qualities about myself that I'm proud of. So again, I think I've said it like three times, but accessing those parts really fills you, I think, with a strength that is organic, that is healthy, and that no one can take away. And standing on that platform, I'm able more and more to naturally speak for myself and advocate for myself. That is so wonderful. So you are the man in the arena. No <laughs> one is there with you. 
<laughs> I love Brene Brown. Um, I really appreciate you sharing that with us. It's it's just so helpful. Um, what is something that has surprised you the most um, that maybe you don't you think most people don't know about you? Oh, about me. Hmm. It's interesting. I think that I've had a couple of different lives at this point, <laughs> you know, as a performer and as a professional. And along those those paths in my life, I've I've known people, you know. And people even now from different times of my life will look at me and talk to me and relate to me as an actor and talk about when I was an actor and things I've done. Other people relate will relate to me as a musician and talk about music and the days when I was playing in the village with, you know, with, with my bands. Others will talk about film. It's interesting in that people uh, who don't know me can be very surprised by these different expressions. Oftentimes people will be floored by discovering other aspects of my life. And that's something that I take great, you know, delight in uh, because it's it's great to surprise people. It's great to have other conversations about yourself that have nothing to do with, you know, the business you're in. As it relates to others and things that I am surprised by, especially in this industry, early on, the thing that surprised me, which shouldn't have, was the amount of humanity <laughs> in artists that are at levels that are just you know epic i've i've been very lucky and it's been a lot of fun to work in this industry where you get to meet your heroes and that has happened on a few occasions where i've met people who by all standards have it all at the top you know, of, of their success. And yet when I've met them and I've worked with them, I was surprised, pleasantly surprised to just see a level of humanity that is just so refreshing. And it reminded me in the best way that we're all the same. No matter how much money someone has, how much fame someone has, uh, we're, we're all part of the same collective. So that's something that helped me when dealing with not only talent, but you know, other uh, executives or producers or heads of companies. You know, it's something that I used to fear, you know, in, in putting people on these pedestals. But I can tell you for certain that people are just people. And relating to someone in the most grounded, conversational way to me has always been the best way to relate to someone. Not exactly answering the questions, Ulema, but hopefully there was some insight in there. No, yeah, no, I think you you did answer the question. Um, I love it. Um, I mean, you've surprised me. I've learned so many things about you today. <laughs> and I'm excited. <laughs> um, I want to ask, as... Um, someone with roots in, you know, Ecuador, um, having lived your life here in the States and some in Canada, how does that lived experience and identity of being Ecuadorian American influence your process? Hmm. I think hitting on something that I mentioned earlier, it has given me a more expanded view of the world. Mm -hmm. Spending time when I was producing in Canada, I, I would, I'd spend time in, in Germany and in France. And, you know, one of the themes running through this whole conversation, I'm sure you picked up on is people and relationships, relationships with people around the world. And I think being Equatoriano, not only gives me a lens from a Latinx perspective, but it gives me a cultural lens that has opened me up to all cultures when it comes to the world. 
And that has gone into informing my storytelling and informing my process because when I first started out in live action, whenever you draw up a writer's list or a director's list for any given project, there's usually a top five, top 10 of, you know, quote, the usual suspects, <laughs> you know, men and women who are constantly working and, and breaking out, you know, big movies and, and hit TV shows. Now I find myself looking at these lists through the lens of where are the voices that need to be heard from a cultural standpoint? Where are my Latinx voices? Where are my culturally diverse voices? Where are those directors? Where are those writers? And how can I, as an executive and a producer, make space for those voices to come forward? And so that we can, through my experience, create a project, create a film or story, TV, you name it, that again, can inch us a little forward in, it sounds a bit cliche or a little woo, -woo but to inch forward in creating stories that can really bind, you know, this world closer together, that can hold us closer together. Because in animation, especially, that is the opportunity we have. Telling stories that can reach an international audience with universal themes and resonant characters. I say it so many times, but to see yourself in a film for a child, especially a child uh, from a different cultural background, to see themselves in a film that is aspiration, there's no greater path to take in creating that kind of content for me, you know, as, as a creator. Uh, something I heard early on in my career was that someone said, you know, when you leave a movie and you talk about the film, not in terms of your favorite scenes, but in terms of how it made you feel and how you saw yourself in those characters, that is the greatest compliment you can give to a filmmaker. And to this day, I still believe it. It's amazing. Um, we're getting close to wrap. So I'm going to ask you three quick answer questions. Oh, wow. And then a <laughs> okay. final closing question. Okay. Um, short answers. Your favorite movie, the song you like to listen to at home with your wife, and your favorite food from home. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, favorite movie? There's so many. <laughs> but I will say uh, one of my favorite films, an underdog film, Rocky. Uh, favorite song at home with my wife, uh, What a Wonderful World, Louis Armstrong. We dance to it quite often. Uh, favorite food from home, uh, my mom makes so many dishes, uh, but I will say a great uh, churrasco is a great <laughs> food from home <laughs> that we uh, will enjoy quite often at home. I love that. And in closing, what words of wisdom do you have for those who are watching? Words of wisdom for creators, for writers, directors, producers who are coming up when it comes to this industry, I cannot stress enough bringing your unique point of view to a creative conversation is incredibly, incredibly valuable. It is the most valuable thing that you have is your unique, distinct point of view. Being able to articulate that point of view is also just as important, but each of us is our own unique creature. And so what we bring to any project, to any conversation, that's, that's the gold. That's the stuff. Do not shy away from it. Practice, 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 defining, honing, articulating your specific point of view. That's a good one. That's a good one. And you mean not what people expect you to say or what they expect you to contribute, but what is truly yours, right? Precisely.
Yeah. Well, Dito, it's been so wonderful to get to learn some more about you and share the conversation with you. I want to thank all of you who are still here, who haven't left, dropped off. Um, I want to thank La Leaf and Latinx and Animation for putting this on. I hope you're all having a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you.